What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? All right, man, I already got questions. Okay, just people saying hello. How's everybody doing tonight? Can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> I don't drink vodka while I do this. It's usually beer. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Make sure I'm flying Devin there. All right. Gives me something to do at work. <laughs> you must have a boring job if you watch me at work. Wow. Um, welcome again, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's having a good Thursday evening. Um, it's, it's raining here, and I've been having some problems with my Wi-Fi, so it might go in and out or skip or something like that we live way out in the boonies and um we use internet wi-fi or um satellite wi-fi excuse me um and it's raining pretty good here so it may kind of fade in and out but i'm on really honestly this time try to do my best to do a really quick video tonight because um, my wife is in the midst of studying for her to finish her master's degree and um She's, you know, in the middle of a big study session right now, so she's got to use the the uh, the internet here in a little bit. We didn't want to both be on it at the same time because we've been having problems with it because of the weather. Um, so she kind of took a break to let me do this. So I'm going to try to make it short and sweet if I can. Um, so what we're going to go over tonight, um, something I've gotten a ton, a ton, a ton of requests on, and I'm trying to figure out how I could do it without you know stepping on toes but we're going to do some some basic um some basic engine oil clearancing show you tell you first you know what proper oil clearances that i use and on these engines are and proper torque specs um kind of how to get those um clearances um what to check for what to look for the kind of basic tools you can use to do it with um but first thing i'm gonna go over is you know like if you order one of our uh, DJ 1105 U-Build It kits. Um, this is a kit that it comes with an engine in the box with most of the parts that you need, pretty much all the parts minus a header and a clutch that, um, that <laughs> all the parts that you need to build, you know, a, a, an AKRA style engine, you know, um, it comes for you with, with, uh, the, you know, the cam BSP4 already comes in the engine. Uh, it comes with you know your valve springs, your carburetor, top plate, fuel pump, chain guard, and all the bolt-on stuff, your springs. Um, but I'm gonna kind of go over tonight about um, just clearancing the stuff because you know, like I say, those those engines may have a racing style cam already in it from the factory in China, but those engines have not been touched by us if you buy the U Build It kit. Um, we have not clearanced the engines; they are not race ready. A lot of people think they are and have problems with them, but I'm going to show you a few things to do to them to, you know, to get them more race ready tonight. One of the first things you'll find when you open our kit is this yellow paper right here. Um, it, it's got pretty much, you know, the dimensions of the engine, um, you know, as far as board stroke, displacement, um, you know, you got your oil capacity, you know, what we recommend to run for is the amount of oil. And then you get on down here and it gives you clearance uh, recommendations your piston to cylinder wall ring in gaps you know your crank pin diameter uh, connecting rod diameters um, all the way down to valve lash and piston head and, and piston to valve clearance um, then at the bottom it gives you torque specs on what we recommend for you know the things that are important with the engine uh, I'm gonna kind of go over this tonight you know this is kind of basic it's not really going to get into any of the you know the true builder stuff but it, it gives some of the you know the backyards and do-it-yourselfers that have wondered how to do this or don't know how to do this a lot of you know how again you know every week I say this this might be something that's nothing new to a lot of you people but there are a lot of people that do not know this and and struggle with it to try to find how to do it and, and, and actually what to do so that's what I'm gonna kind of go over tonight now uh, first things first when you get the engine um, take it out the box and disassemble it. Just take it apart. Um, you know, have a table set up to where you set certain things, you know, like your head stuff over here and then, 
you know, take the crankshaft out and the rod out. Um, just about everything on the engine, as far as, you know, minus the flywheel, um, is going to be uh, either 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter. It's, it's, you don't need a whole lot of tools. You know, the spark plug, I think, you know, is, is a bigger. But as far as the, the dynamics of the short block and the long block, it's mostly, you know, 10 millimeter and 12 millimeter stuff. Um, <laughs> I got some comics here tonight, baby. <laughs> I'm trying to keep this short so we need to keep the comedic stuff down because um, I'll get off rambling on something. But tear the engine down, and as you're tearing it down, once you take the head off the engine, you take the flywheel and all off, and once you take the head off the engine, it's kind of a good idea then if you're going to use, you plan on using the rod and the crank and all this in the engine, which most people do, it's usually good to go ahead and check your... Um, you're in the hole uh, clearance on your piston. Um, when people say, you know, how far is your piston in the hole or what's it in the hole, um, they're talking about how far the piston is from the very top of the block when the crankshaft's at top dead center. Um, these engines, the BSP engines that we use, the Box Stock Project engines, they're usually in the area, I've seen them as low as 3,000, 3,000 is in the hole at top dead center. And I always, when I measure in the hole, I always measure at the top and at the bottom um, because these blocks sometimes they're a lot better than what they used to be but sometimes they're still not planed exactly you know level if you want to call it that most of the time the top is going to be a little less in the hole than the bottom is um, so I always measure top and bottom and I always take into consideration piston rock um, but I measure the top and I measure the bottom and I take the shortest number so if it's three thousandths up here and five thousandths down here, I'll take the three thousandths, which is the shortest, and I usually write it with a marker right here, you know, um, on the head, so I'll, I'll, you know, remember what it is, or either write it down on, on, on a sheet of paper or something to remember. But it's always good to check you're in the hole to begin with. That way you kind of, when I get into, you know, other videos about, you know, setting your, um, your CCs up here, that's where stuff like that's important. But you need to kind of know have some paper set to the side or I write all over the block I mean if people get inches from me they marker numbers all over and they always ask me what it is that's just stuff that you know as I'm breaking the engine down or putting it together I write it down um, to, to remember you know where I'm at or what I'm doing we get you in the hole measurements and then go ahead and finish just sealing the engine you know take the connecting rod out of it the, the crankshaft out of it and first thing um, you do is you just inspect all the parts. You know, look at the connecting rod, look at the piston, because these things are, you know, mass produced in China. Um, I'm not going to skate around the fact that these are Chinese engines. They are made in China, assembled in China, and their workmanship over there has gotten tons and tons better, but it's still mass produced. Um, I've gotten pistons in before to where they went to put the piston in really fast and it, one of the rings caught and it bent. Or I've had foreign materials, mater, materials, materials, got a little too much country grammar going on there. Foreign materials, when they was assembling the engine, to get caught in between the piston and put a scratch on the piston or scratch in the cylinder bore. We just inspect everything really good. Because um, it's right then and there we need to make the note of you need to get a new piston or is the scratch in the cylinder too deep, you might need to bore it, you know, hone it to five or ten over. Um, inspect all your stuff set it all to the side and we're going to start with your uh, cylinder clearance um, like you say on this piece of paper right here it tells you and these are the clearances that I run in my box stock engines that I build um, piston cylinder wall clearance you know you're shooting for around three and a half thousandths um, they come from the factory probably two two and a half you know three and a half to four is you know really what I shoot for um, and because you don't, you don't want to get it out to five or six or seven. You know, some people do them at seven thousands, and you know that that don't leave a lot of life left in the block. And there's really not a whole lot of power if you're using low tension rings and stuff like that to be found from you know four to five or six. Um, so usually I shoot for around four thousandths and um, piston to skirt clearance. And when you're measuring that, you need to have you know, proper measuring tools to, to do it with, you know, with micrometers. This is a mic. 
Um, this isn't actually one for a piston. This is for crankshafts, but I'm just showing you, you know, what the mic is. A lot of people use stuff like this. Um, it, it's better than using a ruler, I guess. But this isn't the proper stuff to use when you're measuring pistons. Because where you measure at, you don't measure the top of the piston. You measure, you know, a little bit off the skirt, you know, right down here at the bottom on each side. Um, again, this isn't what you measure with. I'm just showing you the areas that you need to measure. But um, you'll come just a little bit off the skirt. Man, this camera aggravates me because it's backwards. And measure just a little bit off the bottom. Um, now you'll, you'll, you'll need to use a micrometer, but I didn't bring my big one. Um, I just brought a few little things out here and measure off the bottom and get your measurement. And it also helps a whole lot to have a bore indicator. This is a, a, a bore gauge, you know, a dial bore gauge or a dialed bore gauge, whatever you want to call it. This actually fits down into the cylinder and tells you the size of your cylinder. Not only does it tell you the size of your cylinder, it tells you if your cylinder is round or if it's you know funnel shaped, if it's egg shaped. It tells you the squareness and the size of your cylinder. Um, these can be bought, you know, at, at um, I, we could get them at one time, but I think Goodson's got them. You know, automotive um, supply stores. Um, they're they're expensive, but they're really good to have. I mean, if you're going to be building these engines, and you want it right you've got to have a bore gauge um, to check your cylinder because these, you know, like I said, they're a lot better than what they used to be, um, but they're, they're, they're nowhere where they need to be, which is why we blueprint this stuff. You know, the term blueprinting to me is just a term made up to call it something, but because, you know, blueprints like building a building or building a house is an actual layout, a sketch, and this, that, and the other, but when you're blueprinting it, you're, you're setting all the clearances to what they need to be to turn higher RPMs. You know, this engine with, you know, two and a half thousandths piston clearance will crank up and run on a generator all day long and live a long life, but it's only turning 3,600 RPMs. Whenever you go to, you know, revving these engines up higher to five, six, and even 7,000 in some of the stockers that we run, uh, that's not enough oil clearance. These things are going to expand more and you need more oil to get in there to it to lubricate it properly. And so that's why it's important to, to get, set these clearances where they need to be um, in order for the engine, number one, to make power, and number two, to live a life. Um, so we measure our piston down low on the skirt, um, just a little bit off the bottom, you know, somewhere in this area right here, you want to measure, you know, on the side. Um, don't measure up here because all, you know, most all pistons are tapered. They're bigger down here than they are up here. You know, some's only a thousand, some's three to four thousandths, you know, they got a lot of taper in them. They're designed that way. But that's why you always measure, when you're measuring your piston, down on the skirts, down close to the bottom. Um, measure your bore. Now, there's a lot of people out there, you know, that's old school, I guess you could call it, um, that don't have this type of equipment that use these to measure piston to wall clearance. I'm not recommending this, but just like, you know, using this, this is better than a ruler. Um, and the way people, I'm not, again, I'm not recommending this. I'm just showing what a lot of people used to do years ago before all these fancy gauges come out. They used to build race car engines. You are checking the cylinder wall clearance for this. This is a, this is a four thousandths gauge. Now, I will say, if you use these gauges... You know, you need to have the piston in the engine correctly. You know, we got the, the arrow there that points down. So you want the arrow to be that same direction. Um, you know, they'll slide the, the uh, feeler gauge up in there and just ease the piston out. You don't want to shove it. See that 4,000s? That's as far as it goes. And this is a used piston, so it's got a little wear on it. And, but you want it to kind of ease in there. Now again, this is not the proper method to do this. I'm going to say it again. This is not the proper method to do this. I don't want to get phone calls tomorrow saying, man, you build engines like that? Man, you a redneck backwoods builder and this, that, and the other. I know some really big names that still use feeler gauges. I'm just showing y'all that there is other ways to do this than buying these high dollar gauges. Is this the proper way to do it? No. Does it get the job done? Yes, if you do it right. 
whatever feeler gauge you use, add a half a thousandth to it whenever you put it in this block because these things are flat. And this block, it obviously, is circled. So in order for it to lay down in there, um, it, it, it bends around the piston, and I always add a half a thousandth to it. So me, if this piston were to slide in with just a little bit of pressure, that would tell me that this bore is at four and a half thousandths. I always add a half thousandth to it. Is that something everybody does? No, but someone that's very much more knowledgeable in the engine world than me and 90% of the people I know will ever build, will be told me that if you ever use these, add a half a thousand to it. And I've actually checked it. Um, you know, I, I get this in there and it'd be a, you know, a, a good smooth four going in. I ain't got to put a lot of pressure to it. Measure my piston and do my dial bore gauge and it was right at a half thousand bigger. So again, this is not the proper way to do it but this will get the job done if you don't have the gauges. But just always make sure that your piston is pointed in the right direction. Arrow down, down toward the lifter valley. And just put the gauge in first, down at the bottom or at the top, either one, and make sure the gauge is down in there a little bit. And you should be able to just, you know, put a little pressure to it, not force it, put a little pressure to it and it slide in. And that's one way of checking the clearances on the piston if you don't have these fancy dial board gauges. But again, these are the best. This and this. Alright, now that I've covered my butt about that, I'm still going to get phone calls and messages tomorrow, I promise you. Um, like I say, these engines come around two, two and a half thousand, so we got to enlarge the bore on it. Tons and tons and tons of people will grab one of these to try to enlarge the bore on this engine. Now back in the flathead days, when the uh, engines had aluminum sleeves in them, or they didn't have sleeves in them, the, the cylinders were aluminum before they put sleeves in them, these would, these would do okay. I mean, they would enlarge the bore. You know, it'd be slow, but it would enlarge it and keep it, eh, kind of round. But the only way this thing keeps the cylinder round and untapered is if it's already round to begin with. Um, if this piston is a little bit out of round, or if it's got a little bit of taper to it, or a little bit of egg shape, this will not make it better. In fact, it will make it worse. These are nothing but surface scratchers. Um, this is a refinisher. This is technically not a hone for a cylinder. Um, this is for when you rebuild the engine, the cylinder's got a really shiny look to it, you run these through it, it scuffs up the surface, puts cross hatches in it for oil retention. That's what these are for. These are not to enlarge the bore. These are what this, you know, these are for finishing. You know, if you want to put it that way. But a lot of people will still use them. And if you're making it work, good for you. But the proper thing to use when enlarging a cylinder or straightening a cylinder is a Sun and Stone home. And this is the one that I actually use. I took it out of the machine today and just stuck a bolt in it so that I can hold it and uh oh I got dirty hands first thing I've ever seen that on here man I got dirty hands but um these stones and I've got two ways I use it I use it you know with two stones on these are my you know my next to last step finishing homes here these are about 320 um but when I'm actually cutting a cylinder or trying to enlarge it a little bit or make it round, I use one that's got four stones on it. Um, that's something I made up myself, but this is the finishing part of it, and this will make a cylinder round again. Um, sun and homes, um, you can you can buy homes from places like Easy Bore um, or um, uh, Sun and say, you know, Goodson sells them, um, but Easy Bore is a good place to get them from. I mean, they, they sell all types of homes. Um, but okay, we've measured our our bore, and it's within spec of being round. You know, you don't want nothing to be more than I don't like more than a half a tenth. I mean, a half a tenth, half a thousandth out of round. You know, you can go to a thousandth out of round depending on where it's at, and still be okay. Um, but you know, you want it as straight as possible because if it's out of round any, or it's tapered any, or egg shaped, the rings are going to lose seal. As it, as it goes up and down, and compression is going to get by, or the oil is going to get up. 
um, but you want that cylinder as round as possible. And the only way to do it is with stones. Um, that's, that will make the cylinder round and take the taper out of it. Um, now I kind of got ahead of myself here and I actually made notes and <laughs> still got ahead of myself. But, um, you know, before we start honing, um, actually before we even measure, we need to install a torque plate on the head. Now these torque plates here can be bought from again Easy Bore. Most of this stuff here tonight come from Easy Bore. Um, EasyBore.com. They'll send it right to your house. Um, but you take this uh, the uh, torque plate. God, it's had a brain fart. You take your regular head bolts that it come with. Sometimes, depending on how thick the torque plate is, you may have to put a washer on it. But you take the bolts that it come with, set it up there, put them on there, and torque them down to 220 inch pounds, which is what you're gonna use um, when you build the engine. Now also, whenever I'm honing, my home box has a billet side cover in it and it bolts to it, but you need to have a side cover um, on the engine, um, torqued down just like it normally is, along with the torque plate on the head, because what that's gonna do, this engine sitting here you know, by itself this is kind of relaxed, you know, in a normal position. When you put the side cover on it, because of the dowel pins, um, it may not line up exactly perfect. It might be just a little bit off, not enough to bind anything up, but it could put a little pressure on this block and, and cause things to move. That's why I put a side cover on it, torque it down to, you know, the proper specs, which is 200 inch pounds. I'll go over that in a few minutes. Put the torque plate on it, torque it down to 220. Now you're ready to measure your cylinder. The reason you want to put all this on, because this is how the engine is going to be when you're running. It's going to have the head bolts in, they're going to be torqued down. If anything moves or gets out of line, it'll do it now. You take your measurements, and if you're using, using a feeler gauge, you're not going to be able to, to, to see this kind of stuff. All you're going to see is the basic clearance at the top of the bottom. That's where this comes in at. Um, this dial bore gauge, you know, you run it up in there, you can... You know, you can get you know, straight up and down lines on, on, oh crap, I should have done that. Straight up and down lines on how big your cylinder is, but you can also, you know, twist it and turn it. You gotta learn how to use one. Twist it and turn it to um, find out your taper, if there's any taper in it, if it's bigger, you know, top to bottom than it is side to side, if it's out of round. That'll tell you after you bolt everything down if anything's moved. And like I say, that's what these torque plates are for. You want everything to be honed and measured just like the head's on it, ready to be run, just like the side cover's on. Because when those bolts, you know, they run down beside the sleeve on each side. And when you torque them bolts down, it, it moves the metal. I mean, it's microscopic, but it moves it. And, you know, it, it could misshape the cylinder, especially if it's a cylinder that's been bored and it's thin. Um, it can misshape the cylinder. So you want that misshapenness there as you measure and also you know, when you run your stones through it because that's going to make the cylinder round when it's torqued down. Um, it don't matter what it is with the torque plate off of it because it's going to change. It could change when you put the torque plate on it because things kind of move around. All right, torque plate on side cover on it, whether you're using the stock side cover or the billet side cover, put it on, torque it to 200 inch pounds, torque plate to 220 inch pounds. All right, now we've measured our cylinder. Um, let's just go ahead and say we've got it honed, we've got it round. Um, you know, with we, if you're using stones, you can use, you can grade your stones up, go with a coarse stone first, and that'll get your cylinder the shape it needs to be. Now go easy with core stones because they move a lot, remove a lot of material really quickly and you can get your cylinder too big. Usually what I do, um, I'll use, I got some 80s that I use when I'm trying to, when I first put a cylinder in and trying to get it round. I just barely touch them out to it on the stones, run it up and down four or five times. I stop and I check and see how much material I'm moving. I just go really slow with the 80s, only four or five, six strokes and that's it. Take it out. And then when I get, you know, to within a thousandth, thousandth and a half of where I want the final to be, maybe you know, maybe a thousandth or two thousandths, I change the stones and put a finer stone on it. I go from a, you know, I meant to say not 80, but a 180. Then I go to this 320. 
and you know get the final size to it. It's only removing just a little bit of material, you know, about a thousandth, thousand and a half to two thousandths. And that leaves me with my, you know, the finish I, I want. And I actually, the last stone I put in is a 320 um, because I use what's called a plateau hone after that. Now, this hone here is a complete last stage finish hone. When, um, I know you've seen the diagram a hundred times, you know, people's drawn them here and there, but when you hone, you know, you're leaving, I am no artist by no means. So, you know, the, the cylinder is going to kind of have this look here to it when you get done. And this is very dramatic, but it's going to have what they call peaks and valleys. Wherever you cut the hone, it's going to leave scratches in the, in, in the cylinder, some a little deeper than others. And you start coarse, and as you go finer, those peaks and valleys get smaller and smaller. And what you're wanting, you know, a lot of people finish on, I used to finish on a, on a 400 and I finished on a 600 some too. And I've just found that finishing on that 320 and then running a plateau home through it a few times gives me a better break in and a better engine life. Um, it don't, it, it's smooth enough to cut down on drag, but not too smooth to wear out quickly. Um, but what this plateau home does, unlike the home I showed you at first, the first one is called a ball home. It's just got little abrasive balls hooked to it, and it scratches the cylinder and, and leaves a, a surface ready to break rings in on. The plateau home cuts down those peaks and you know, those peaks closer to the valleys. It takes the sharp edges you know, off of the metal. It's like when you drill something, there's going to be a little edge left. And that's really dramatic. These are microscopic. But this, um, I'm going to answer some rod side-to-side -side questions in just a minute. You run this plateau home through it, it's just, you know, kind of um, coated plastic um, material. I forget what this is actually called, um, but there's not really much abrasiveness to it. This is a, I think this is like a 600. And just put it on the drill, and with the torque plate and all still on it, you know, I run it through about eight times, which is in four, out four, you know, one, two, three, four, all the way to eight, and that's it. Um, what this does, it just knocks a little bit of those edges off and helps give you a little bit of quicker ring seal and a lot less material in your cylinder when it's breaking in. Um, again, I'm running through this really quick because I'm trying to get done so my wife can have time to study tonight. And that's what marriage is, 50-50. You got to give some and, and take some. But, um, uh, we've got our cylinder honed and, you know, again, these hones here, we can get these hones. Um, you can also get these through Goodson, and I believe Easy Bore also has these also. Um, they'll have both of the hones. Uh, okay, we get our cylinder clearance. We're at our four, four and a half, five, six, seven, whatever you want. Like I say, I use around four, and we're kind of done with that. Um, something else I like to do that not many people have tools to measure, but the lifter bores down in there. Um, they're usually clearanced pretty good, um, but I like to run a hone through them also, you know, to, to for oil retention, you know, because when you hone something, you leave that little crosshatch pattern, and uh, that's something else I wanted to talk about while I'm on, I'm sorry, let me back up just a little bit, when it goes to honing, um, you want to leave, there's no way you can see this cylinder, I know, eh, you can see it a little bit. But you want to leave, you know, the little scratches or the, um, I really thought I'd get through tonight. I really did. But here comes the star of the show. Hey, buddy, come here. What you doing? He's actually got on clothes tonight, people. Isn't that amazing? He's got on clothes. He's got his favorite driver's shirt on, the monster. Few people know what that means. Hey, you wanna, um, I don't have nothing for you to play with. Oh, those are dirty, baby. Those have got oil all over them. Yeah, I brought dirty homes home. Sorry. <laughs> um, hey, you wanna play with, um... We're fixing to get a bath. Okay, y'all fixing to get a bath. Mm -hmm. I have nothing that's not really sharp in here. Okay. Oh, now he's chasing the cat around. Anyway, while he's walking around in the background, um, hey, baby, come back over here. You'll knock that over over there. 
You gonna get it back? You're just looking for something to get into, aren't you? Is that a flag? That is a flag. That's actually your flag. I need that. You want your flag? Yeah. And see, tonight, this is one of the very, very few times I'm actually wearing pants so I can stand up and get his flag. Because usually I don't have on any pants. There you go. You like your flag? Yeah. <laughs> Are you gonna wave the flag for everybody? Wave it for everybody. Wave it. Wave the flag. <laughs> All right. Good job. Mama, uh, I got a flag. He got his flag, and that is his flag. He picked it out at Home Depot one day. That thing cost me ten bucks, but it was worth it. Anyway, um, deuces. Um, where was I at? Oh, honing. Um, even even when you're clearancing the cylinder up till you know your finer stones into your plateau, you want to leave kind of the same pattern, or you want about a 45 degree angle on it. You know, it, it, people argue, you know, do you need do you need sharper? Do you need shallower? Depending on the type of rings you use, and yada yada yada. But I I still settle on the 45. I kind of use that one just been using I've tried other ones and didn't really see no difference and I just go back to what I know so you want about a 45 degree angle on your um on your hone marks um what that does is is it it it's got a few jobs uh, number one um because of the peaks on it the little sharp edges out you know even the plateau hone don't get all that off what that does is it helps break in the ring when the engine's fired up um, number two it holds oil for lubrication um, and the rings come down. There's still a little bit of oil in there that the, in, the rings actually ride on once they break in. And number three, during break in, it holds metal deposits. You know, as the rings go down and, and, and that little bit of microscopic metal comes off, it holds deposits in there. And then when the engines fire, um, it, it pulls them out and you know, blows them out the top or if it sucks them down at the bottom. It's very microscopic stuff, it's nothing big. Um, but you want to leave a decent cross hatch, you know, visible with the eye, but you really don't need to be able to feel it with your fingers or your nails. Um, for those of you that actually have nails. <laughs> but, um, all right, cylinder, we've talked about homes, plateau homes, we've done the stones. Okay, we've got our cylinder honed. Um, I typically leave the torque plate and all that stuff on until I'm ready to actually clean the block. Um, but when we get ready to clean the block, we take the torque plate off, and like I say, we've got the lifter valleys down in there. And um, you can buy hones of just about any size. This is a little bitty ball hone right here. It's a fine one. It's probably four or five hundred grit that I will run up and down the um, the lifter valleys, or not lifter valley, but the actual yeah the lifter. Um, I've got something on me. And what that does is, you know, same thing with the cylinder. It leaves a, a, a really fine crosshatch pattern. I'm not trying to enlarge them because um, they come pretty close to size. I mean, you might want to, um, Sam Stalker, don't don't talk about training stuff on here. Not not you of all people. Um, but you want to leave, you know, the same you know 45 degree crosshatch in because that helps hold oil, helps lubricate stuff. You know, because something with, you know, microscopic scratches designed to hold oil is got less drag on it than just a flat surface with oil on it. So you can get these also from Goodson. Um, we have these, you know, we have a, a, a few varieties of, of homes that we can get. It ain't something we keep on the shelf all the time, but we can get them in pretty much any size you need for these engines. Um, it's good to have a little stuff like this because, you know, it helps clean stuff out. Um, but... I don't, I don't do a whole lot of time on it. I run it in and out, you know, six, seven, eight times just to leave a little bit of pattern. And just in case there's any material in there, it helps pull it out. All right. Now, we've got our block honed. And we've washed it out, you know, with, um, you know, I use a parts washer, stuff like that. Um, some people take the bearings out of the block when they hone them and stuff. I don't. Um, I just got a way of cleaning them that gets them clean. Um, but you can leave the, the bearings, you know, the ball bearings in the block if you want to, but you got to do a really good job of cleaning it. But right now, we've just done a basic clean on it with the parts washer, which is nowhere near clean enough, but it's clean enough to start checking ring gaps. And 
there's several different style rings you can use. These are, I'm using the ones that come with the engine. These are bone stock rings that come off the piston that come out of this block. Um, you can use them. There's no problem with that. That's one of the reasons that you're setting the, the cylinder clearance. You're making it a little bigger um, because what that does, not only does it allow more oil, the proper amount of oil up in there to, to lubricate the engine, um, but it's taking a little bit of tension out the rings because just a ring is a spring. Ring is a spring. That rhymes. Um, you know, the closer you put it together, the more tension it's got on it. And when you, you know, increase the size of it, it takes a little bit of drag out. Now, I do recommend for those of you that don't know how to detension your rings to buy the low tension ring set. Um, I detension my own. Um, I've got a, a jig built that, you know, I detension my own sometimes. Sometimes I use the low tension rings that we sell that Dynac makes. They're good rings. Um, but I don't detention the top one. I leave it standard stock right out the box. Um, I do a little work to it, which I'll show you here in a few minutes. But I do detention the second ring, which is called the oil scraper ring, and the oil corrugated ring at the bottom. Um, that's Those two there are where a lot of your drag is at, but I don't like detention the top ring or using the low tension ring that comes in dyno's kit they're great rings don't get me wrong but what i've seen with the higher rpms that we're turning these days you know 68 7000 that the low tension ring will have a tendency to to flutter um at those rpms meaning it's 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 kind of jittering up and down the, the cylinder wall it ain't holding the compression back like it's supposed to um so i'll use the standard oem one or a file to fit top ring depending on you know, what the application is. But right now we're using a standard OEM right out of the box, right out of the engine ring. Um, to set ring gaps, you can do it with just the ring. The best way to do it is with an old piston. And uh, of course I got us a nice ARC rod on there for display for everybody to look at. But you want to start with your top ring. And again, this is after we've honed the cylinder, everything's good, and we've we've done some basic cleaning with you know the parts washer. You know, but we got a lot of cleaning left to do. But um, when I prep my rings, you know, before I ever try to to uh, check the gaps on them, um, there's a technique called lapping rings, which I'm not going to get into that tonight because that is a a learned trait. It's not something you know, easily, it's something you can mess up on really, really, really quick. I've messed up a lot of rings trying to learn how to lap them. It takes a special tool. And we're doing, you know, as little specialty tools as we can tonight. So what I do, um, what you can do is take, you know, a scotch Bright pad. You know, I like one that's got a little wear on it, not a brand new one. Um, but we're going to pretend this is a scotch Bright. Um you know, take the, take it and wipe the inside of it. You know, Scotch Bright's got a you know a rough area to it, and sometimes these rings have a little bit of coating build up here, especially if they're been detensioned, which we use heat to do that, or if it's the low tension rings, um, you know, they have a little bit of build up on them, and you want that off. And you just take the Scotch Bright and just kind of wipe the inside of the ring, and you know, lay it flat on your finger, and you know, do it both ways. A couple times is fine. Then I'll take the scotch bright in between my two fingers and hold the ring like that. You're not putting a whole lot of pressure on this, but you just put enough pressure to hold the ring and just kind of run it back and forth on there. You know, you're not trying to press down and sand the ring, um, which is what lapping is. You're polishing one side of it and all, um, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, it really didn't bring anything to do it with, the biggest reason why. But take your scotch bright and just put a little pressure on it and just kind of wipe the top of the ring like you're trying to you know remove an ink stain or something you know and i always do it one way then i flip the ring over and do it the other way if you feel a brand new ring it's got some sharp edges on it and when you lap the ring what you're doing is you got a, a flat surface you can use a piece of you know plexiglass i got a piece of aluminum that we've cut and planed and you have a tool that you set on top of the ring on some sandpaper and you know you you run it around and what you're doing is you're taking those sharp edges off the ring and you also you're making it you know the same size all the way around uh, and making sure the ring is square 
and flat. Um, but you can take what you need to take off with Scotch Bright in your hand. Just don't put a lot of pressure on it, and just you know run the ring you know through the Scotch Bright and try to keep it even and do that two or three times, and you will remove the very tip of that, which is what breaks off during when you first fire the engine up because the rings move around a little bit. That breaks off and gets in between your cylinder, and that's what causes them little fine lines that run up and down your cylinder when you first crank it up. Um, you need to remove that, and it helps you, you know, it helps the ring break in better, plus it helps it seal better. Now, I also take the Scotch Bright and I'll lay it flat in my hands and just kind of, you know, not putting a whole lot of pressure. You're not really trying to remove the ring, it's just, just in case there's anything hanging out, just in case some of the coating is you know, botched up there or something, but, you know, again, you're not trying to remove material here, you're just kind of trying to just polish it and make sure there's no little edges hanging out. I want to do that just a little bit. You know, I do the sides, you know, pretty good, but I want to do this, just kind of run it over once or twice, and, and that's it, because you don't want to try to remove any material. All right, we've got our ring kind of buffed and cleaned up. We're going to check the ring gaps. Checking ring gaps is simple as can be. All you do is just Carefully put the ring in the engine. And I'm doing this backwards from where I used to do it because I'm left-handed and used to do it on the other side. So um, stick your ring in there and I use a piston. Um, and usually what I'll do to check the upper is I'll take a just you know one of the bottom corrugated rings, a three-piece ring, and stick it in the, you know in the, in the middle groove. I know that's not where it normally goes, but what you're using it for is a stop. You're going to stick your piston in there, and you're going to push your ring down. And that ring that's on the middle end is going to stop when it hits the top of the block. And that ring is going to be the same area all the way around. It's going to make your ring level in the block like it's supposed to be. You know, because if the ring is caught one way or the other, it can, you know, throw off your measurements. And when, you, when we say setting the ring gaps, what we're looking to do is, you know, this gap right here, when you put it in the cylinder, you know, it, 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 there you go, it closes up and the ends almost butt. You don't want them to butt. You know, the top ring is the most important ring. I typically, even if my cylinder is, is straight and square and really good, I typically don't go below 6,000. I try to shoot for between six and eight on the top ring. And it's simple. All you do is get a six thousandths feeler gauge or eight thousandths or whatever you want it to do, find the gap and just run it through there. And this one this one's a little big. Actually no it's not that ain't bad. That's probably about ten thousand. I got a this is I had a yeah this is an eight. I got a four here and an eight. And all you do is just check the gap. If it's too tight which is where the file to fit rings come in at. Um, you just ease your ring back out and try your best not to twist the ring or you know take it out like this. You know, don't do not just take it out like that because when you twist it like that, that's catching on those sides over there and it can create a little scuff on the ring. Try your best to you know ease the ring out. You know, all in one swoop so it all comes out at the same time. If your ring is too tight. Um, you know, they got ring grinders that you set it down on with a little wheel and it grinds it off. A lot of people still do it with a file. That's why it's called file to fit. Um, I know this, again, this isn't the proper tool to use. I'm just pretending this is a file. You know, you're always, when you file your ring, you want to file inward. You want to just keep it flat and inward. You don't want to do it like this. Um, when I file it quicker, but what that's going to do is it's going to pull metal outward to the outside of that ring. When you put it back in your block, it's going to scratch your cylinder. So you want to keep it straight. You want to keep it flat and do it slowly. You know, don't, don't, don't get in no hurry. Just keep it flat and file it. File it. Again, this isn't the proper way to do it. This isn't the way I recommend for everybody to do it. But this is the way a lot of people still do it and the only tools that they have. The proper way is with a, a ring grinder which is a little tool that's got a handle on it with a wheel and you stick your ring up there on it and turn it and it, you know, cuts the side of the wheel and it keeps it good and straight. But if you're doing it by hand, remember, always go inward. Always. 
And even after that, if I know I kept it straight and all, I'll, I'll still take my, my Scotch Bright and kind of rub around the end just to make sure. Run it through some cleaning solution, clean it off, dry it off, put it back in your cylinder. And then get your piston with the ring on it and run it back down to where the ring hits. And that keeps the ring square in the block. And then check your clearances. If it's where it needs to be, you're good to go. But I also, I'll get this ring off, you think it's hard to see. You need to check the ring at the top of the cylinder and at the bottom of the cylinder because you know the ring don't just move in that area, it goes all it goes down. So what I'll do is take the ring off the piston and you might want to kind of rub some WD-40 in it. It'll need to be dry. Um, you know, most vats or vats, parts washers, you know, have mineral spirits with a little oil mixed in with it. That's usually not enough lubrication. I'll take some WD-40 and squirt in there and just kind of, you know, ease the ring down to the bottom. And this piston is going to keep everything good and square. And with a stock piston, I typically run it just below the top, you know, just where I can see it go inside. And that puts the ring about three quarters of the way down the cylinder. And it helps to have longer, um, well, these are the same size, helps to have longer feeler gauges than this, but this one will work. And you want to measure the gap while it's down there. Um, because if you don't have the dial bore gauge like I was showing you a while ago, you don't know if your cylinder's true. This will tell you. Because if you've got a six thousandths gap at the top and you push it down and the ring bottoms out, butts together, that means that your cylinder is tapered, you know, big to small. Or if you push it down and the ring goes from six thousandths gap up to twelve thousandths or ten thousandths, they ain't going to be that big. It might go from six to eight or maybe nine. That means that it's tapered, you know, small to big, you know, it's bigger at the bottom. But that's why it's important to measure your ring at the top of the bore and about three quarters of the way down um or you can go on down further than that but i typically go about three quarters of the way down and if you're you know got the same measurements at top and bottom you're good um as long as it doesn't butt together you know if, it, if the taper gets bigger if it goes from you know six to you know maybe seven thousandths or even eight thousandths not saying that's proper but it's better than it going from six thousandths, you know, down to two, um, because when the engine gets hot at two thousandths, the ring can possibly butt together, and that'll cause a lot of problems. And I also usually push this on out the bottom with the piston, but um, it'd be all right. You can do all 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 the rings that way. You know, your second corrugated ring, now corrugated, your second old scraper ring. Now, when you're cleaning it. Um, this ring, the top ring, is got a chrome face on it. Um, the second ring is all black, and there's letters on the rings. You know, all of them have, I don't know if you can see it. Well, there it is. It's blurry right there. But um, all of them have letters on it, and the letters go up. And on this ring, if it's a legal BSP ring, it really, it's not really important which way it goes. So if the letter's on the wrong side, it's no big deal. But always make sure the letters are pointing up toward the top of the cylinder. Now, the second ring, which is the oil scraper ring, is all black. I have run into a situation a couple of times where these rings, the letter was on the wrong side. This ring goes in one way and one way on. If you put it in the wrong way, this thing's going to smoke so bad you're not going to be able to see behind it. Um, so, you know, do the same thing with the Scotch Bright. Inside of it, do the sides and on the outside. Now, a lot of the times on the outsides, It'll rub some of the coating off and you'll be able to see a silver line appear on them. If you notice, this ring has a, right, where can I see it? See that silver line that goes around the bottom? Dang it, man, I need some better lighting in here. The silver line is just, is less than halfway from there to the bottom. If you take a used ring out, it shows it very well. I mean, the whole outside of the second ring usually is not completely, you know, worn off. Usually it's about a half or three-quarter. Um, but 
if I always recommend checking this ring and the way you can check it is to have another block sitting somewhere don't use the block you're fixing to run have another block sitting there with a stock bore on it and put this ring on a piston with the letter up you know because a lot of times the letters are right but I have run the situations where the black the second ring the oil ring the letters on the wrong side and the way to tell which way it goes have a, a used block not the one you're using put it on a used piston not the one you're using and just you can do it by hand just stick it down in the block I could do this a whole lot better at the shop when I'm working on the side of it it puts the Joe dirt in the hole Uh, we gotta switch sides. I gotta do it left handed. <laughs> and plus, this is a dry block, so the ring's not really sliding in there good. Uh, stick it down in the block, hold your hand at the bottom so the piston don't come out, and just run it up and down the, the, the cylinder of the other engine a few times. You ain't gotta sit here and do this long. Just run it up and down, you know, 10, 12, 15 times and of a used block not the one you're planning on running i can't stress that enough i've had people call me back and say hey man i done what you told me to do and it scratched up my block use another block and a piston not the one you're planning on running and run up and down 10 15 12 times whatever and when you pull it out it will have removed the coating on the ring there it is you see it there now see that silver line at the bottom It'll be black and that silver line stick out. That silver line goes down on the ring, I mean on the piston. When you install it on the piston, that silver line needs to be at the bottom of the black ring, which goes into second groove. Um, chrome ring on the top, black ring with the silver line that you just wore in goes second. And of course, then your you know, corrugated three-piece ring goes on the bottom. But that's a way to show how this ring is supposed to go on the piston because if you go by the letter alone you know, I've only run into it like three or four times but I have seen where the letter was on the wrong side of this ring I had one the other day I put on the dyno I fired it up and it smoked a little bit and I'm like well you know maybe you know we'll seal never did it got worse and worse and worse and it was smoking bad and all I did was I popped the piston out took the top ring off flipped the second ring over and put it right back together, run fine, done real good on the dyno. But you need to make sure that these go in the right way. All right, I need to get on the ball here. All right, we've done our rings. <laughs> okay, um, now this right here, walking this way, is a true American kid. Come here, baby. Daddy, it's cat food. That is the cat food because he got his flag. Come here, baby, bring it here. And he is now, come here, in his underwear with his flag. All right. At least one of us has got pants on, right? Right? You've had a bath, haven't you? All right, here you go. Here's your flag. All right, you walk around back there. I'll have him say him walk around. i got to keep going. Um, uh, we've got our rings sized. I mean, our rings, uh, the ring gap set. Like I say, uh, all this on the paper. Um, the top ring is the most important ring. You're wanting to make sure that you're between six and eight thousandths on the top ring. The second rings, I'm not going to say, are not important. Um, you don't want them extremely wide, but you also don't want them to butt together. Um, you know, if they're, I shoot for, you know, eight to ten thousandths on them is fine. Um, I don't, and I check all of them. You know, I check the clearance on the, or the end gap on the second ring, and I also check the end gap on the three-piece correlated ring. But I check, you know, just the little pieces, you know, each one of those at one time. Um, if you're not using low tension rings, which means this has not been heat treated and shrunk, you can take a little bit of tension, you know, out of this by sanding, you know, the ends, the tips right here. If you look at a brand new one, they've got a little bit of a lip that hangs out like right there. And you can take a file and just file that little bit of lip off. Remember, always go inward with it on both sides and I'll take a you know a little bit of tension out of the ring um, which will loosen them up for you which will you know create less drag 
Um, to study. Why you got a measuring cup? You ever measuring prep? Yeah. You measuring prep? You know you shouldn't be doing that, right? He's not measuring prep. He's yeah. just got something out the cat's box. Don't freak out. All right, we got our rings, the gap set. Yeah. Um, we filed down our little, um, the little corrugated ring on the bottom. Take the stress out. All right, now we got to look at the connecting rod. Uh, we take the connecting rod out. Um, you know these these you know they're marked on you know which way they go together. But it's just like you know our billet rod. You know you got the oil hole here. You want the dipper and the oil hole on the same side when you put it back together. Now, clearancing the rod is probably the most important thing in the engine, far as making it live or even even you know last any time. But um, there's a couple ways you can do it. Um, again, you will need a dial bore gauge for the connecting rod. This is for the cylinder. They make them for several different sizes, and you can buy them, you know, small enough to fit down into the uh, rod. And you want to put the rod together and torque it to 120 inch pounds. Um, again, that's all on this paper, and I'd be glad to send a copy of that to anybody via email or whatever fax. Um, but you want to torque the rod down to 120 inch pounds with some oil on the threads because that's how tight the rod's going to be when you put it on the engine. And with, with the dial bore gauge, you'll take the dial bore gauge, of course, and stick it in the rod and measure the rod. And what you're looking for on the connecting rod is between two and a half and three thousandths clearance. I typically try to shoot for three. And the oil clearance is how much clearance is in between the connecting rod and the crankshaft when it's on there um, tightened down. Now I have a video that I've done about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, on this exact subject on checking clearances. And I show you um, you know, how to use a mic, you know, to check the check the crankshaft and how to use a, a dial bore gauge inside the rod. And I use one of our billet rods and show you how to install the bearings and also y'all can look that one up. I won't have to go over all that tonight. Um, for time reasons, but um, what you're looking for in this rod, the reason I like to use the gauges instead of plastic gauge, is because again, you're checking for roundness. Plastic gauge don't tell you if something's round, it just tells you how much clearance you got in that one area where the plastic gauge is at. That's fine, you know, that plastic gauge is gonna, gonna give you the clearances you need and, and get you by, but you need to make sure this is round, that's why you need to use a dial board gauge, because if it's not round, you're not getting oil everywhere you need inside this connecting rod and if it's if you check the plastic gauge and it's three thousandths here but it's only one and a half thousandths on the other side you know if you turn it then you're not getting enough oil over here and it's going to cause the rod to start galling you need to have the same clearance all the way around that's why it's important to make sure the rod and the crankshaft is round now again a lot of people will use she left the door open i'm sorry a lot of people, I guess you heard me. <laughs> a lot of people will use these to try to check the crankshaft. Not the proper tool to use, but it will get you by and may be better than your plastic gauge. You know, you can stick it on there. You know, you need to check it in at least two places. Again, this isn't the proper tool to use, but some people, some people do it. Um, Cause see, I'm just kind of wiggling around right here and look at the differences I'm getting. I'm barely moving my thumb. You know, you can't get really accurate with this thing here. That's where your micrometers come in. Again, I got a video on this to show you how to do all this. Um, but you want to measure, you know, you want to measure in at least two places. Straight up and down and side to side. You know, I'll take it sometimes and do, you know, multiple places. But this is the most important place. It's straight up and down and side to side. If you check there and you're round, you're probably pretty good. Um, now, when you check your clearances on your shaft, if you're, you know, most of the time these shafts from the factory are going to be a little big. Uh, the clearance is going to be too it's going to be too too big here, too little there, and it's not going to have enough oil clearance. So you got two options here. Um, number one, if the crankshaft is big, you still need to polish it down. I like my journals to be no more than one inch, 180 thousandths on a clone journal. Now, Predator is bigger, whole nother video. We're doing clones tonight. Um, one inch, 180 thousandths on the crank. 
and I don't like it to be any less than one inch 179 thousandths, which is only a thousandths difference. Um, so I typically will polish my shaft down to around, you know, at least one inch 180, 179 and a half. Um, and that, that can be done several different ways. I got a crankshaft polisher, you know, which is a whole lot easier to do. But I have, back in the day, clamped these things down on a vise and used emery cloth. Um, which is emery cloth is one side is sandpaper, the other side is a polishing, um, little polishing pad or something. But it comes in strips. And you want to use something like a three or four hundred grit. You don't want to go too fast and you want to leave a good finish on it. You know, you'll set it up there, you'll measure here, you'll measure here. And you take the emery cloth, you know, and you polish it. You know, you go all around it and you, you make sure you keep moving and go a little at a time. Work on it a little bit, you know, wipe it off, clean it off, measure it. Work on it a little bit, wipe it off, clean it off, measure it. And get it down to about, you know, one inch, 180, you know, one inch, 179 and a half. Um, and something else I want to show you on these crankshafts is something you can do to help keep metal out of your engine whenever you first start it up. Now, I'm not saying this is, is legal in AKRA or NKA, um, but it still helps. If you look around the inside of the crankshaft, you can see it plain as day right there. This little area right there. That is part of the casting, and it don't stick out, but it just it, it, it's, it's a little rise in the in the casting right there. That whenever you put the rod together on the crank and fire it up, the rod moves side to side, and it does that right there. See that shiny area? That that little piece sticking out catches that rod and puts it, it, it grinds it off, um, and it puts metal in the oil, and it it, it can cause problems in the engine so what I do is I take a Dremel and a very fine stone with a very steady hand and I just kind of knock it down a little bit just a little bit you know just knocking it down and it's on both sides Let's see if I can get that to show yep there it is right there right there um take a little Dremel man you can see that one good take a little Dremel and just kind of knock it down because what that's going to do is going to take that off and it's going to keep this rod from scuffing on the side and that one's pretty deep there and um, that keeps metal out of your oil now you got to be very careful with that now backyarders, outlaws, you know, modifies, you ain't got to worry about that but um, AKRA stuff, you know, I'm not telling you, recommending you doing this and I'm also telling you straight in your face that that's technically not legal. Um, it's not a performance enhancer. It's not going to make the engine run better. It's just going to help keep metal out of the oil when you first fire it up during break-in, which is you know, the most important time of the engine because that's when things are breaking. You don't want extra metal in the oil. Now, you, you do that and you don't clean it up real good and you go get caught. Don't say Joey the ARC told you to do that because I'm telling you right now, it's technically not legal and you can get tossed out for it if you don't cover it up well. But there again, it doesn't help the performance of the engine, so that's one of those judgment calls. Um, but do that, you know, before you go polishing your shaft, because when you put the shaft up in there and start polishing it, you can your belt will kind of hit that a little bit if you make the belt just a little bit wider than I mean we're not talking that much wider, but just so that the belt, whenever you have the strap, you know, going around it, it kind of touches the sides and it'll, it'll help cover that up. You know, so you're doing two things there. You're, you're sizing the shaft and you're covering up your little, what you've done here to help keep metal out of your oil. And, um, but once you get the shaft, you know, down to one inch, 180, one inch, 179 and a half, we want to measure the rod. If the rod, let's, let's say the rod is round, um, but the rod needs to be, you know, about one inch, 182, 182 and a half. Um, that's going to give you, you know, your, your two and a half or three thousandths clearance. You know, because if the, if the crank drum is one inch 180 and the rod is one inch 182, that's two thousandths clearance. That's a little tight, in my opinion. So we've only got two thousandths clearance, so we need to hone the rod a little bit. Now, this is this is the reason why I like to polish the shaft to get the clearances right, because a lot of people mess up honing the rods. 
because just like with the cylinder, they use one of these. Now, this will remove a lot of material because this is aluminum. This is cast aluminum. This is some soft stuff here. This this um, home will size this rod out in less than 30 seconds if you're doing it right. The problem is a ball home running through something like this does not keep a straight line. It's going to, when it goes into the rod, it's going to enlarge this side, then it's going to go small in the middle, and then it's going to enlarge this side. So it's going to have the rod shaped like this. And, um, you know, you might have 3,000th clearance in the very dead center, but you close to six over here on the edges. And what that's going to do is when you're running the engine, you know, that oil comes in through the oil hole and is through the oil hole here and is spread around, you know, like a butter knife scraping across a piece of toast is going to spread the oil around and that keeps it literally has a thin sheet of oil that stays there that protects the engine. And if that thing is, is tapered like this where the inside is got less clearance than the outside does, that's going to push the oil out. And it's going to be just like a funnel. It's going to funnel that oil outward and it's going to run the center of the rod dry. That's why a lot of people that flex home their rods wind up breaking rods because what it does is that. You see that black line there? That is where the rod was getting hot. And this rod here has very, very little time on it. Like a few break-in sessions, that's it. Um, of course, you see this, you know, every, you've got flex homes for everything. You can you know, flex hone and, or whatever you want to do with, with the rod because it's legal to flex hone here now. And, but we're here, um, getting off subject. That black right there is where the rod was getting hot and starting to gold. Now, if I took this to the racetrack, probably in the second heat, maybe in practice, this thing would have probably locked up and went out the front of the engine because it was used, it was clearance with one of these. Now, in the center of the rod, you know, it's got about, from the way I measured it, it's got about three and a half thousandths clearance on it. But out here, it's close to six. Um, so when it was clearance with this, it clearance in the center like it's supposed to be. But when that hone is going through there, it's when it first goes into the rod, it has to push those balls together. And then it goes through the center and clearances properly. And out the other side, it opens them up. And that is the result. And I... Every time somebody calls me up and say, you know, I honed, I clearance the rod, and yada, yada, yada. And I ask them, you used the ball home, didn't you? Yeah, I used it, and I've been using it for years, and I've been having problems. Some engines run for a while, and I take them down after two or three races, and they have that in it, you know, or they lock up. Well, that's because the ball home is shaping the rod like this. Now, you can use this ball home once it, you know, let's just say this rod was, you know, because they come all different sizes. They don't come like our ARC rods does, you know, with tenths of a thousandths variances. These come with thousands of variances sometimes. Now, I've seen these rods come, you know, 1 inch 183 out of the box, which means that would be 3 thousandths clearance if this was 1 inch 180. Um, but if it's where it needs to be, you know, it's fairly round, or it's round, not fairly round, but round, and the clearance is where it needs to be, I will use a ball home to run through it 1, 2, 3, 4. That's it, because all I'm doing is putting cross hatches in it for oil retention. Um, I've got room to do that no more. I've got another technique that I've been using for quite a while. It's an actual rod home with stones that keeps everything square and round like it's supposed to be. Um, but if you're using this to size a rod, be very, 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 very careful because it will lead to this, and it will mess up your engine. Um, and like I say, with your clearances on your rod to, to crankshaft, you're looking at three thousandths. Now, on your on your wrist pin, um, that comes in your paperwork also. Um, here comes my little naked boy again. He's gonna make a three peat tonight. Hey, buddy. Hey. Are you wild and woolly tonight? Yeah. All right. I'm That's right. I don't know what he just said. Um. Hey, you want a gasket? You want a gasket? There you go. Go put it on your engine in there. Go put it on your car. Go change the gasket on it. Here. <laughs> it says here. 
Um, but on your wrist pin, you know, it comes with clearances also. Um, where is it at? Where is it at? Camera, crankshaft. Oh, yeah, small end of rod. Um, yeah, it gives you, you know, your big end, you want, you know, 1 inch 182 to 1 inch 183. Um, that's what comes on our directions. That's what I use. That's going to give you, you know, 2.5 three thousand if your pin is 180. Now, on your, the small end of your rod, you know, you're looking um, for, the wrist pin I want to say is 708 thousandths on average, 707, 708, so you want this no bigger than about 709, because you don't want but, you know, a thousandths and a half or so clearance, you know, on the, on the big end, on the small end of the rod, so you're looking for 709 on that one. Um, but again, this sheet, um, I'll send to anybody, and it comes with our engines. All this is on there. And again, you know, they have flex homes for this. And I don't size with this with a flex home, but I do run a flex home through it just to give it a little bit of, you know, oil retention. Um, all right, now when we go to um, assembling this stuff, you know, you, you've honed your engine. Um, you've done a spot clean on it, you know, you kind of clean, you know, cleanish your rings and set your gaps. You know, we've, we've, uh, polished our crank, got it down to one inch, 180. Um, we've either honed with a rod hone or we've, you know, cleanished the rod and, and got a little bit of, um, ball hone surface on it for oil retention. Now I'll take the rod back apart and take a wore out scotch brad. I've got some over there to the side, some scotch brad pads that are, you know, they kind of almost fall apart. I'll take my thumb and just kind of, you know, kind of just buff the inside of the rod a little bit, you know, kind of like what I'm doing with the, with the uh, plateau hone, kind of knocking down them high edges, knock that out. And um, when we go to cleaning it, I use carburetor cleaner on all this stuff. I'll spray it down in it then use my, you know, wash material or my wash solution wash it out, spray it again with carb cleaner, and same thing with the crankshaft. Now be careful with this metal stuff, because you spray carb cleaner on it, it dries quickly, and it will cause it to start surface rusting pretty quick. So be close to your, you know, washing solution or have some WD-40 on hand. Spray it down with carb cleaner, wash it with your solution, spray it with WD-40. And I do the same thing with the block. When I'm cleaning the block, um, I take carb cleaner, spray all inside the cylinder, and then, you know, I use my, my wash, um, my wash vat has oil in it, so, you know, I can just kind of spray it in there and it don't, don't rust up. But if you don't have a wash vat, spray your carburetor cleaner and spray some WD-40. And I use a brush. And actually, it's a, I get it from Walmart. It's a, it's a, a toilet brush, but it's round. And not the, the donut shape, but it's round. It goes in the cylinder and it cleans it good. And you take some, you know, your carb cleaner, and you spray it from WD-40, take that brush, run it in and out inside of your cleaning solution. And I do that, spray the whole inside the engine down with carb cleaner, use my cleaning solution. And then I use soap and water, and you gotta be warm soap and water. Um, it's gotta be, you know, not hot, but it needs to be pretty warm. I got a deep sink over there. And I fill the sink up with really, really soapy water like Dawn dish detergent so that you know the water comes at least halfway up into the cylinder with the block sitting like this and i use that brush and i'll in and out in and out brush it brush it brush it spray it with carb cleaner wd-40 back down in the solution brush it brush it brush it and you cannot get these things clean enough um if you use a soap and water like i do and i use it on the rod same thing carburetor cleaner um you know, solution, clean it out, soapy water, clean it out. Um, crankshaft, I use soapy water, but you gotta be quick. You know, carb cleaner on here, uh, soapy water, you know, use a brush, wash everything down. I take it out, blow it off really quick, and I spray the whole thing down with WD-40. Set it to the side, because I'm gonna do some more cleaning on it and the block. And once I get the block out in the water, I uh, pull out the water, spray it with WD-40 inside the cylinder and if the bearing's still in it, you know, you clean the bearing real good, spray it with WD-40. A lot of people use, you know, what's called sonic cleaners. They, they put up the parts inside of a big case and it uses, you know, waves and sonics to, to, to clean these engines, you know, a whole lot better than what we're doing here. But again, I'm showing backyard stuff. Um, you know, you got to have all this fancy, you know, equipment to do this with. 
Um, once you get it out of the water, spray it with WD-40, blow the engine off, then, you know, we clean it. We still clean the block. Well, you can't clean this block enough. Um, I'll get two different rags, you know, paper towels, and spray one down with carb cleaner and the other down with WD-40. Take my hand, go in there, clean the block really good with the, with the uh, carb cleaner, and right out and right in with the WD-40 because it will rust quick. Uh, and I do that three or four times until there's nothing left on the paper towel. Spray the paper towel down with carb cleaner, spray another down with WD-40, carb cleaner, out, WD-40 in. I do that until there's nothing left on the rag. If it takes six times, seven times doing it, that's what I do. WD-40 last, and then I go to, um, I have a mixture of, it's about 25% mineral spirits with automatic transmission fluid, or tranny fluid, as somebody called it a while ago. Put that on the rag and clean them with it. And believe it or not, there'll be more stuff come off of it. You clean it and clean it and clean it until there's nothing left. And, you know, blow everything out good. And I'll use carb cleaner in the bearing if I leave it in. I don't do it all the time. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. You can't get it too clean. You know, down in all the, all the holes down here, because all that home grit falls down in it, and you got to get it out. All in here, all in these little areas here, you got to get it clean. Clean it, then clean it again, clean it again, think about it for a little while, and clean it five more times, because you cannot get it clean enough. But make sure when you get done, that you wipe a last coat of WD-40 inside the cylinder so it don't rust. Um, once you get everything dried and clean, you know, put your seal in, or put your bearing back in, you know, for us the ones that, that use the slip fit bearings, which is now legal. <laughs> um, put your bearing in, if your bearing was already in, you know, put your seal in, put a little oil in it so it don't, it's not dry. Get your crankshaft. I, I know I'm rushing through this, but my wife gave me a look. She's ready to get online and do some stuff, so she ain't got to stay up all night. Uh, get your crankshaft. You know, we've done cleaning it a couple times. You know, paper towel with WD-40 the same way. You know, wipe this down. You know, um, carb cleaner on paper towel, WD-40. Carb cleaner on paper towel. You got to do this but three or four times, you know, because you're not really honing it hard. But make sure you get a brush and get down in this hole right here, you know, because they be deposits in there sometimes. And clean the crankshaft real good. Spray it down with WD-40. Um, connecting rod, we've cleaned it. It's ready to go. Um, now, I'm not going to do an assembly thing because, you know, I don't have room here to do all that. But, um... To put the rings and all in it, you need a ring compressor. Um, I hear people talking about using popsicle sticks all the time. Yeah, that kind of works, but then again, you can scuff the side of your ring, or you can get a piece of wood, break off, and get that in between your ring and scuff your cylinder. Um, you know, they use popsicle sticks. They'll put this piston in right here, and you know, use the popsicle stick on top and bottom to push the rings in and you know go in one ring at a time one ring at a time but i've seen situations where a piece of wood is broken out and got in between the ring and the piston and kept the ring pushed out and it would scuff the cylinder or mess up the ring and then you got to do all this over again so you can buy ring compressors at o'reilly's um i've seen them at um um, um auto zone places like that you know, lawnmower shops, or, you know, ring compressor is a ring compressor. You know, you got the old click style, then you got the people, you know, just got the fancy ones with the plier grips that grip them and pop them in. Those are quicker and better, but the old clamp style with the little ratchet is just as good as anything. You, you can use it, you know, oil everything up, put it together. Um, that's the best way to put the piston in it. Now, when you're Torquing everything back down, you know, once you put the rod on, and you always need to make sure that the oil hole and the dipper are facing down with the arrow when you put it back on. You know, you want the oil hole in the front, dipper facing down, arrow facing down, because that's the way it goes into the engine. Now, once you get the rod and piston put in, then you have the crank slid in. Um, make sure when you put the crank in that you wipe it down you know, with whatever oil you plan on breaking the engine in with. I don't like using assembly lube in these. I like using, you know, if you break it in on regular oil, 520, 530, or if you use our Lucas, you use Amsoil, whatever. Whatever oil you're going to break the engine in with is what you assemble with. That's what you put on the pistons, what you put in the cylinder, what you put on the rings, that's what you put on the crankshaft before you put it in. 
put the crank in. When you go the rods in it, you want to wipe oil, you know, inside here before you put it on the crank. Put it on the crank. You want to wipe some on the back. Um, get your bolts, and I take a little bit of oil, like the, you know, this, this drip that into the pan, and wipe the threads on the bolt down. And because you want a little bit of oil on the threads when you put them in, because it helps them torque better. Uh, make sure the cap's on right. Put the bolts in, and on your connecting rod. Um, I use um, 120 inch pounds and you know I go 100 pounds here 100 pounds here and then go to 120 then 120 and some people use a little more torque than that some don't use that much but I've been using 120 pounds for since we started building these engines and it's it, it's worked fine um, but use the oil that you plan on breaking the engine in with to assemble the engine because if you put assembly lube in here that stuff is thick that's the only way oil can get in this engine. That little bitty hole right here, and it's got to be splashed in there. This engine's going to crank up and run 10 revolutions, 20 revolutions, 50 revolutions before all that stuff burns out or slings out before oil gets in there, which can lead to that. A burnt rod. Um, use the oil that you're going to assemble the engine with. That way it's already in there and there's nothing that's got to burn out and it's instantly um, lubricated. Um, now, when it comes to torquing, the rod, a lot of people say, I don't need no torque wrench. You need a torque wrench. If you're going to call yourself an engine builder, you need a torque wrench. Now, I've heard a lot of people talk about Harbor Freight torque wrenches, how bad they are, this, that, and the other. Obviously, I got a good one. Harbor Freight makes good stuff every once in a while. I paid $20 for this torque wrench, and I've been using it for several months now. Now, Having said that, this is a $20 Chinese torque wrench that needs to be broken in, just like an engine. You cannot get this torque wrench out of the box and it work like it's supposed to. You're going to break bolts, you're going to ring bolts off, you're going to have a bad time. What you've got to do with this Harbor Freight torque wrench is set it to the highest setting. Mine is 220 inch pounds, which is what the head is. Set it all the way to the highest setting and find a bolt that is welded to the table, that has been torqued down, that is already tight, put a socket on it and sit there and click it. Because the first time you click it, you're going to have to pull on it hard to make it click. Because the little mechanism in there that does the clicking has to wear in. It, 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 it's too hard when you get it too stiff. So you have to sit there and click it and click it. And as you click it, you're going to feel it getting easier and easier and easier. And when it gets down to the point to where it's feeling the same all the time, the wrench is broke in. It's that simple. We've had people say they've broken stock rod bolts or ARC rod bolts with Harbor Freight torque wrenches. I just built this new engine, went out and bought a new torque wrench. They get it out the box, they go to click it, and they set it on 100 pounds, and they got two hands on it uh, with 100 pounds, and it you know it breaks the bolt. Um, not saying that's the case all the time, but nine out of 10 times, it's Harbor Freight torque wrenches. They have to be broken in. Like I say, I've been using the assembling engines with this one. My personal engines and the engines that I sell, the engines that I test for ARC, have been put together with this Harbor Freight torque wrench for the past probably six months or longer. But they got to be broken in. Once they're broken in, they work fine for a $20 torque wrench. I've compared it to one that I use at ARC, and it's within a couple of pounds every time I test it, I test it against one another. So they're decent for the price, but you got to break them in. Now, after you break in your Harbor Freight torque wrench, if that's what you're using, and you need to use a torque wrench because that's what torque specs are for, the torquing a bolt is putting the bolt in and stretching it. That stretch of the bolt, it acts like a spring. That's what keeps it tight. Um, but all this, again, is on the paperwork. The torque values are down here at the bottom. You know, your stock OEM connecting rod is 120 inch pounds. Now, an ARC rod, a billet rod, is 170 inch pounds, but it comes with paperwork on its own. I got a video on that that I done years ago. Y'all can watch that one. Um, my cylinder head, when you're putting it back on, whenever you torque the torque plate on it, or whenever you torque the actual cylinder head on it, I torque it to a 220 inch pounds. And the side cover, when you're getting ready to hone the engine and when you're assembling the engine to run, I torque it to 200 inch pounds. Again, all of these torque specs and clearances are on this paperwork that comes with it. That's why we put it in the box 
because it's a you build engine. If you wanted me to build the engine, you're gonna pay a little more than than what this engine costs. You're gonna pay a lot more than what this engine costs. I ain't gonna lie to you. But this is a you build engine, and you are responsible for all of these clearance and torque specs. It says so right on the back in plain English. But um, that's the point of the you build is you know we're putting this out you know so you can build it and. Now I've kind of really run through very, very, very fast with a lot of information. So I try to get this to my wife because it's raining really hard here now. And I've already seen the internet kind of be wavy a little bit. Um, my nose was fast and I run through it fast and kind of jumbled around. But y'all can go back and watch it again. Um, I will take a few minutes to answer some of these 400 questions. It's probably the whole, good God. Jesus Christ, I should have been answering these as I go. Um, okay, I answered that one live, I answered that one, um, and I got a co-worker there saying he's not getting the video, yeah, right, you just don't want to watch it. You know, Jeff, it's, it's, it's been almost a year, buddy, since the, um, the, uh, oil plug thing, and, um, y'all getting some good mileage out of that. Hello from California. All right, that's good to know. Yeah, Tom, that's that's what I was laughing at earlier about um <laughs> funny comments. That's that's the truth, Tom. Can you use a piston without the skirts? Ain't that indecent exposure? <laughs> um, they are some pistons out there, some small wrist pin pistons that are very very short. Um, you got to be really careful with those pistons, and I use less piston clearance on those because. You know they're so short. You know they tend to rock more. That's what a long skirt does. You can, you know, open your clearances up a little bit more, not a lot more, with a longer skirt than you can with a shorter skirt. Um, it's, you know, I tell people to basically. I, I like to use analogies to people to kind of make them think about what they're saying here. Short skirt versus long skirt. You know, a short skirt. You know, you can't bend over in it. You'll show your backside. <laughs> you know, for those of you, those of you guys out there that actually wear skirts. A longer skirt, you can. You can run, you know, more clearance with a longer skirt. You got more more room to move with a longer skirt than you do with a short skirt. Um, short skirts, I like to keep it right around three thousandths if I can um, with the ones that I use. Um, like with a wise coat, that's not wise coat isn't necessarily a short skirt that we sell, but I still use a little tighter clearance than that. Cali, a lot of California people in here tonight. Good deal. Man, y'all on fire out there, man. I, I hate it for the people out in California, man. That place is burning to the ground, and they ain't nothing they can really do about it. I, thoughts and prayers going out to them people, man. There's a lot of people being, their houses burning down, businesses burning down. It's awful out there. Uh, stock bore animal piston, same thing. Um, you're looking at around four thousandths. Um, any stock bore type piston, you're going to be looking in the area of four to four and a half thousandths. Now, wise coes, the short wrist pin pistons, short skirt pistons, you might want to close them down just a little bit. Side to side clearance on the rod. Um, I'm going to be honest to you and tell you this right to your face. I've never measured that on a stock rod as far as measurements. Now, I've taken, you know, I got like a, you know, a, I think it's a three thousand feeler gauge that I have set up little jigs like this and done it, but um you know, you're wanting you're wanting, you know, three or you know, three or four thousandths at the minimum on that. Um, because you do want it to wiggle side to side because, you know, your crankshaft has in place so your rod has to do that also. But, you know, you want you don't want a whole lot, um, but you do want some. Um uh, on the billet rods, I have measured that quite a bit, you know, and, you know, four or four or five thousandths is, is about what you, the minimum, absolute minimum that you want. But there again, if you run a lot of end play on your crankshaft, um, you know, you might want to run a little more. Um, but technically, you ain't got much option when it comes to these stock rods um, because if you're running in a series, you know, you can't, you can't grind the side of the rod down. I'll throw you out for that. Now, if you run a backyard, you can do what you want to. Well, welcome, Bob. Thanks for watching live for the first time.
you know, Ricky White, you know, like I say, whatever comes stock on these stock rods, if you knock the little burr down that's in there, whatever comes stock on them is fine. Now you can set a little more side to side clearance with a billet rod because, you know, the the way we make them, you can, you can buff them down, you can sand them, or you can, you know, do like I do and go in here and open the crankshaft up a little more right here on modifieds, not stocks. Now stocks, all I do is cut that down. Modifieds, I've been known to come in here and work in this area to kind of maybe help funnel oil in and get a little more clearance in it, but, you know. All right, all right. No, Nick, I do not have him a mini bike or a go-kart yet. Um, we're working on that. There's Sam with his tranny fluid again. I just, for those of y'all that know him, y'all, y'all know why I make that joke. Do I measure how much drag I prefer on the piston rings? If so, how much do I like? Well, in AKRA, there's a rule in there that says the corrugated oil ring, which is the three-piece ring on the bottom, on the piston has to hold up the weight of the piston and the rod in the cylinder. Um, I've done all kind of measurements on that, trying to find out, you know, with weights and stuff, exactly what I need to do and this, that, and the other. And that's where I've settled in on, you know, uh, ring gaps, low tension rings, and my clearancing. Because um, if you use low tension rings and detention them like I do, about four thousandths clearance um, is going to put you pretty close to that weight, which is why I only rebuild engines one time before I go to the next size, which is either a two thousandths or a five thousandths or a ten thousandths piston. Um, sometimes the next rebuild, you know, the cylinder's got a little more wear than it needs to, and I have to hone it more, so I go ahead and go to a two or a five. Um, but you know, the four thousandths clearance, if you detension your rings like I do, is is about where you need to be. If you go any bigger with low tension rings, you're going to run the risk of the piston going through it, you know, not holding the weight up, or you know, oil getting by. Um, as far as an actual poundage measurement, no, I, I don't measure that. Well, I've used weights, but it's kind of homemade stuff. It's nothing, you know, official, you know. <laughs> How far out of round is acceptable with the cylinder or with the crankshaft and connecting rod? Because the cylinder, you know, you can go a thousandths out of round and still be okay. But if you're more than, you know, more than, I don't like going over a half thousandths out of round with the crankshaft. Um, I have put them together before with a thousandths out of round. They run good, but it still kind of worries me because, you know, like I say, if you know, most of the time you're going to be short in this area. You know, you may be dead on one inch 180, but because of the way the crank wear, just going to wear more in this bottom area right here. So you're going to be out of round here. And when that thing's going around and, and that oil is being spread around inside this rod, like I said before, when it gets to that thick area, you got a good film. And then it, as it turns around, it gets to that thin area where it's only, you know, two thousandths clearance because it's out of round. It pushes that oil out of the way and the rod actually connects, you know, touches the crankshaft, which you know, causes wear or causes it to gold. Um, but uh, Dave Chisholm just answered my question. I didn't even have to say nothing. One thousandths or less. Good job, Dave. Diamond Dave, the Chisinator. Yeah, Brad, that's why I see Bradley's got one of my engines and these Sharpie marks all over it. Um, some of it's kind of hieroglyphics looking. I just, you know, it's a, I wouldn't say a code, but stuff I do just to make people say, hey, what is that? Chicago, Tennessee. Hey, my neighbor's watching, Stephen Reynolds. I mean, you can probably just look out your window and see me there, buddy. Sorry I didn't answer the side-to-side -side clearance, Ricky. Um, I tried to get through this as quick as I could, so I knew I'd have a lot of questions to answer. And my son interrupted me a few times, which I'm not going to tell him to leave when he comes in here. Um, you know, I'm going to take time to talk to him, but sorry I didn't answer it. I hope I answered it the best I could a while ago. Hey, Brian, you're right. You know, a snap-on uh, three-eighths or a quarter-inch drive um, torque wrench is way, way, way better. Um, but some people are on a little lower budget. And like I say, the Harbor Freight one, once you break it in, and you got to sit there with it on the highest level and just... I went, actually, I started on the highest level, 
and went down 50 pounds all the way to the lowest and just kept working it, it works fine now. I'm not saying it's the same quality as a snap-on or as accurate, but you know, I, I started using them because I hear a lot of people use them and have problems with them, so I wanted to find out what they were all about. Uh, North Carolina. Brian, uh, if you give me a call tomorrow or call the front desk or something, they will fax you or email you a copy of this sheet. Anybody else that wants one, just call the front desk, Miss Jamie or Mr. David, Hunter or myself. Um, ask for any of us and tell them you want a copy of the uh, torque spec sheet that comes in the engine, and, and they'll send you one. Yeah, show me performance. Yeah, there's not much you can do with the stock rod, um, you know, outside of running with no rules. I mean, you can, you know, go in there and if you're not running against rules and, and sand the rod and get a little bit more if you need it, you know. Um, and like I said, with the billet stuff, sometimes I go in here and, and cut out here, but not much you can do with the stock rod and stock uh, applications. You can adjust it if you're not running any rules. Alabama. Um, ooh, that's a, one of those loaded questions there, Barrington. Um, do I think the engine builders who have $450 engines do all these things, and if they don't, how long will they last? I got to walk lightly here. Um, I've run a... <laughs> Let's go four times tonight. How about that? What's up? Oh, you got a cookie? Yeah. Can I have one? Yeah. Get him back out the door for a minute. All right, um, $450 engines I've run against, been beat. I rarely, I've, I've run against $450 engines. I've been beat by them. I've seen them win big time races. I've seen them win Saturday night races. And of the few builders' engines that I've been into over the past few years, which I do not do that, um, a lot of you people on here just call me about engines and they've got a so-and-so engine. I'm like, well, I really don't like going in people's engines because they're dealers of ours. I don't do that. I rebuild my engines. Or if you're a backyard tailgate builder, I'll help you out with an engine. But I don't like going through builders' engines because it can cause problems. They can go through mine when they want to. I just don't like going through theirs because of the business thing. But of the couple of engines that I have gone through, they were $500 engines. This has just been a year or so ago. I, they were they were well built engines. I mean, there was nothing wrong with them. Um, they brought me a cookie. I don't want to get out. You gone? Oh, I got three cookies. Look at her, y'all. We got three. I got three. Good job, buddy. Can I get a high five? Can I get a doofus? Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's one of our things. All right, tell them bye for the last time. <laughs> All right. Um, but no, they were $500 engines and they were built as good as anything I've seen out there. I mean, they were honed, they were clearanced. Um, the rods looked good in them. They were clearanced correctly. You know, they may have had, you know, the, 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 the cheaper billet flywheels on, you know, like, the, I'm not saying cheaper, the lower cost, like the PBL flywheels, a little bit cheaper flywheel, good flywheel, you know, dependable flywheel, good flywheel. It's not cheap. It just costs less. Um, you know, a lot of them save money that way. They use, you know, a lot of this stuff on these high dollar engines, you know, is powder coating, is custom top plates, is all that stuff. That's where some of the money comes out. These people, the engines, you know, were, were yellow side cover or blower housings, had a little decal on it. The cheapest top plates they could find, the cheapest headers they could find, and they run good. Now, are some of them not doing this? Possibly. I don't know. But the few that I've actually been into, I'm not naming no names here because they don't like to get into that kind of stuff. It was somebody really needed something bad. This person couldn't get to it. And I actually called them and said, do you mind? And they said, no, go ahead. Um, so that's why I've done it. And um, they, were, they, were, they were good engines. They, he should be charging more for them, to be honest with you. And I told him that. Now i got a kitty cat down here playing with me. Um, let's see. Size of the oil hole doesn't matter. Um, I'm assuming you're talking about the oil hole in the rod. Um, yes, it matters. Some people make them bigger. I don't like doing that. You know, I do, I have a little tool that I go in there and try to deburr stuff and round things off. 
I don't like making holes on stock rods any bigger than they have to be um, because that's less material. You know, you could cause a crack there. But I know a lot of people that make those holes a little bit bigger and they get away with it. Um, but you know, bigger is always better to a certain extent. Um, then you start causing the, the rod to get weak. Um, I assume that's what old hole you were talking about. All right, I'm done with the questions that's come up now. So, again, I hate that I had to I rush through this. I didn't answer questions as I was going like I usually do. Um, but I really need to get off and let my wife have the internet because, yeah, it's still flooding pretty bad out there. And I got to, I hope y'all ain't seeing what I see in because the picture is kind of funky looking. Other than me being in it, I mean the actual, you know, video picture. Not me looking funky. But, um, all right, I believe that's all of them. Uh, this will be uploaded later on as soon as I get done. Uh, we'll put it on YouTube tomorrow. We gotta, you know, go to our YouTube channel, ARC Racing on YouTube, and watch all the videos I've ever done. Um, even even the original ones I've done, you know, that wasn't live that I've done, you know, video production. Um, I got the one on the flywheel, how to install a flywheel, and I got the one, like I said tonight, that shows you how to install a rod, how to check for clearance, how to plastic gauge what plastic gauge is, proper bolt torque, uh, the way to, you know, the, the up and down of them, stretching the bolt, all that good stuff. That video is on there. All the videos I've done is on YouTube and on our Facebook page. They're easier to find on YouTube because you just type in ARC Racing and boom, look for the logo to come up and they all come down. Um, he started putting the logo on all the videos because some of these videos... The still picture it shows it looks like I'm you know drunk or or just got off drugs or something. So he just used the logo that makes it look better. But anyway, look us up on YouTube, uh, arcracing.com's our uh, website. One eight hundred five two one three five six zero eight hundred number. You can get a hold of me or Hunter or anybody. Uh, Jody at arcracing.com is my email. And thank y'all for stopping by. I hope it wasn't too jumbled up for y'all to understand. If so, um, just let me know, and I'll I'll do another video, you know, and do better. But um, got to get off. I'm getting some evil eyes over there. So thank y'all for stopping by. See y'all next time.